John kind of explains why Python, how Python works in block, blockchain and why it matters. So let's watch a little bit of this because this was one of the best explanations. This was the explanation I was looking for before. And I think it's uh, almost there. So let's let's take a look. Yeah. And so let's talk a bit more about, about the pre-Python world on blockchain. We're going to get into use cases as to why you should care a little bit later, but let's maybe start talking about that. Like, like if you wanted to develop for blockchain before kind of Python arrived, what would it look like? The, the barriers are pretty significant, aren't they? Yeah, and so maybe we should take a step back and talk a little bit about what it means to develop apps for a blockchain uh, as a platform and as an operating system versus may maybe more traditional platforms like your laptop or your desktop computer. You know, um, when, you're, when you're learning software engineering in college or school, um, the first thing they will teach you about is um, of course, the basics of 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 how you express business logic in in, in, a, in a language, but 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 also um, to recognize that the things you type, the code you type, doesn't run on the computer directly. Instead, that code where you say, you know, if this, then that, uh, that logic, that code that you write, that gets compiled, uh, targeting a particular architecture. And by the way, I think their I think their podcast is really great. Uh, it was, it's surprisingly good. Um, usually, usually I'm not a fan of company podcasts. I think they just <laughs> they come up kind of like cheesy, and it, it seems like a lot of times I think when companies or organizations come out with a podcast, it's usually like, oh, someone someone just thinks, hey, podcasts are hot. We should have our own, so let's do one. Um, in this case, and you know that might have been the calculus here too, but I think this combination of these three these three folks, uh, men. Mark and John, I actually think comes out pretty well. So I actually kind of enjoy this. Uh, but this is this is the explanation I was looking for. So it's coming. So, um, you know, when you write when you write code, you 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 must before you can run the application on any computer, whether it's a smartphone, a desktop, or indeed a blockchain, um, you have to compile the code down to what's known as uh, machine language, and this machine language is quite literally ones and zeros. Um, that the CPU or the brain of the computer um, can interpret and process and, and, and do instructions upon. And so, you know, when you write that first Hello World app on Windows and the code is essentially print Hello World, before that spits out um, the words Hello World to the screen, you must compile and then the code, sorry, the, the compiled binary, the ones and zeros are the machine language code uh, is run by the computer. By the way, that's, um, that's like, for, for those that don't, understand the reference like hello world is sort of like almost universally like the very first program that you write in any language like every lesson one is always hello world because it's usually like set variable equal hello quote hello world quote uh print variable you know whatever in python it's pretty simple and others it's maybe more difficult but uh we'll see why that but yeah that just so you know when he's saying this this is like the basic level coding program that you will start that's like your very like your day one like every online instruction that you take that's like the first one and so it's actually no different on a blockchain um it's just a bit more constrained and so maybe just like when you move from a desktop computer down to a cell phone and you have you know not as much memory on a cell phone and not as much not as much compute power on a cell phone you got to think differently about your app you can't just brute force your way through things um you know, writing apps for that smaller screen and those smaller resources makes you write apps a little bit differently. Again, we can take one step further on blockchain and we can say we can say that when you write apps on blockchain or write apps targeting blockchain, you also have to work within uh, the constraints of the blockchain. Now, blockchains broadly, not speaking about anyone in particular, are, are very powerful uh, and they enable classes of application that are just not possible on other platforms. And we can discuss a little bit later, we can get into maybe some of those use cases and why they're important. Um, but just if we take for this moment and we say, if we accept that, okay, if I want to take advantage of these blockchain specific use cases that are only possible if I target blockchain as my platform for, for my app, um, one then has to realize that the code I write the app for the blockchain, which we all call, by the way, a smart contract. A smart contract is an app on blockchain, essentially. Um, that that code um, will will have to get compiled down to um, a low level machine language that the blockchain understands. And so, continuing with this with this comparison to, to to phones and to desktops, 
the Intel or the Intel chip in your, in your laptop, right? The core i7, the core i9, uh, the AMD Ryzen, uh, the ARM chip in your, in your Apple Silicon laptop, the M1, the M2 Pro, the M2 Max, the, these things. Algorand has its own CPU like this. It's called the AVM. And when you write apps on Algorand, you're targeting the AVM. So your, your code gets compiled down into what's known as bytecode that gets run by the Algorand virtual machine, which is a virtual CPU, essentially. And so that's the start of a blockchain journey. That's like, that really like helped things make a lot of sense for me. Cause I always wondered, and you know, I've asked a few developers like how this works and, uh, I don't know. I just never, I, I never felt like the explanation really, really helped. But John, John just really nailed it and explained it well here. I think how that works. That uh, you know, the AVM is because I was like, you know, I knew I was familiar with terms like AVM, but it's like, what does that actually mean? So AVM uh, basically is a, you know, it's a virtual machine that you write code to. So instead of writing to a computer, you're writing it to this virtual machine. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then to very quickly answer your question, you know, uh, prior to AlgoKit, which is our product that helps you build, test, and deploy apps on Algorand, and prior to the release of Python for Algorand, so you could write apps just in regular Python, individuals had to go and write very low-level code, very close down to that machine code level, in order to get Algorand to do things. And so that wasn't very much fun, and that's the learning curve I'm talking about. And that's and that was the case for all blockchains, right? Like if you want to to develop on Ethereum, you had to learn Solidity. Like other blockchains have similar kind of more low level type of languages. Is that right? Yes. So maybe we could explore two that I know quite well because I worked on them. Uh, Ethereum has the Ethereum virtual machine, um, which of course is very very similar to the Algorand virtual machine. It's just not as fast and not as precise. Um, and Cardano um, has its own kind of like a virtual machine, kind of like a virtual CPU. It's called the Plutus interpreter, and it runs uh, Lambda calculus or, or Plutus code. And so, yes, um, all blockchains have this low-level CPU, and indeed, they have languages that you use to tell it what to do, to run apps, just like we write code on, on desktop computers. Um, what's interesting, though, maybe, is that um, Ethereum has been around a long time. It's been around, you know, very popular since 2014, 2015, okay? And so it's had a long time for its developer tools to mature, just like uh, the iPhone, just like the Android Studio, you know? I mean, uh, it's, it's had nearly a decade of, of, for those developer tools to get great. And so Ethereum does have its teal equivalent, okay? There's an, an Ethereum instruction set, but no one ever really used it. People uh, kind of got to start off in Ethereum using Solidity, which is like JavaScript. Um, and I think uh, that's probably the great advancement uh, in understanding what AlgoKit 2.0 uh, brings to the Algorand platform. Um, AlgoKit 2.0 brings that moment of um, ease of use. It brings that kind of solidity level ease. Um, you just have to use regular Python now to build your apps rather than having to uh, write your apps in, in, in lower level uh, primitives. And that just seems like so much easier because um, a lot of people are already familiar with Python. It's one of the most in, so it's one of the most used languages, I think, because it's so flexible and simple. Like there's kind of a saying that Python is like the second best language to do just about everything, you know, whether it's uh, data analytics or graphing or and, you know, it's it's kind of comp it's a complicated language because people say well it's a scripting language and i'm like yeah but i mean you can write entire code in it too so i don't know i i'm like definitely not an expert in coding i am like an amateur at best barely barely a hobbyist i would i would call my efforts especially since now chat gpt makes it so easy it's like it's almost like why bother you know it's uh well just the other day and the new omni is really good um i made I gave it some data and said, hey, can you make a Python data visualization with this? And it spit it out. Did Not only did it spit it out, it actually runs it. It actually can now run it in the chat. That is, and I don't know if like regular chat GPT is doing that because the, they give you like kind of like you can test it out a little bit. They give you a few iterations and they say, okay, now you can't use it. You can't use the Omni version until, is it Omni? It is Omni, isn't it? The O version, chat GTP O. Um, yeah, they can't use it for like a 24 hour period or whatever, but, um, I was just blown away with how powerful it was compared to the previous version. It's, it's pretty amazing. So, um, yeah, was that just the end of it or what? And so, yeah, oh, go ahead. 
So, so what is what does it take for for a Python developer to get started? So they go, they download AlgoKit, and and so can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, it's quite literally two lines. Uh, you go on your computer and you type. If you're on a Mac, you type brew install AlgoKit. If you're on a Linux box, you type uh, pipx install AlgoKit. You hit enter. It installs just like any other package, just like um, installing Mozilla, just in, installing Chrome. Which, uh, it's as easy as that. And then um, you just uh, go back to your command line, type uh, AlgoKit in it, and then that's it. You name your project. It gives you a template. You click play, and then you've got an app running on testnet it really is that easy it's really great um it's it's quite literally as easy as your first app with, with the iphone it's as easy as your first app with an android phone um i'll go kid in it that's all you got to do um yeah min what were you going to say yeah before we get to min like <laughs> should i do should i like try to do this on stream sometime i think that'd be really interesting just actually try to <laughs> try to like just just live stream my attempt at trying to make a an Algorand app of some kind. I'd probably fail st installing it. I'm so bad at, I don't know why terminal just really like, like I found a video editor that would like cut out all the silences for you that, but you had to run it in terminal. And I could, it, it took like, well, I couldn't find any instructions for Mac. So I was trying to like transpose the PC instructions to Mac and um, I couldn't quite get it. <laughs> I could get it to, uh, I could get it to install and pop up and everything in terminal, but I couldn't get it to go. But let's see what Min has to say. I'll go kid in it. That's all you got to do. Um, yeah, Min, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was just going to say, you talk to us a little bit about how we got to, you know, why Python? Because I think it sounds like, of, of course, reaching 10,000 or thousands uh, of uh, Python developers out there. But also, I feel like there's some unique characteristics about Python that could really be interesting for how you think about developing on. Uh, Absolutely. So when we chose Python, we did it for a number of reasons. I mean, with all kind of major engineering decisions, it, t it tends to be a mix or a cocktail of different of different um, different reasonings. Um, the rationale behind Python was essentially kind of uh, threefold. The first, um, AlgoKit itself is written in Python. Oh, I didn't know that. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. It, and and in software engineering generally, it's it's. And by the way, we chose AlgoKit for uh, we chose Python for AlgoKit because it's fast, uh, powerful, yeah. and simple to write, simple yeah. to maintain. Um, things that you need, by the way, in, in your smart contracts. Um, and so, and I think he said, I think he said TypeScript is the next one. I know some people thought JavaScript. I think I thought I thought JavaScript, but I think it's actually TypeScript is the next one. I know he said it somewhere. It might have been later on in this one. So, um, it's very when you're building software, you like it's easier if you don't mix languages so much, and and so we we chose to stay with Python for that reason. Um, a second reason is because it's quite literally one of the most popular languages in the world, um, alongside TypeScript, um, which we're going to bring uh, later this year. And then I think, I think, finally, if I had to pick one further reason. Um, it was a bit of a speculative bet, but we noticed how excited people were getting over ChatGPT uh, 3.5 at the time. Um, and we felt maybe, you know what, wouldn't it be great if we had a language that's encompassing everything from the students in high school, because they teach Python there because of its simplicity, all the way to the high end kind of ma machine learning experts, data ML engineers, um, of which now, you know, many, many people are going to university with an interest in this. Many, many people are naturally learning Python because of this industry that's booming. Um, and so, yeah, I think it was the right choice in hindsight. Um, but essentially, the most important characteristic was that it was a world class language that was simple, easy to use, and very popular. But the one thing I'm super excited about Python is actually the ability to bring in all these experienced developers, not just web three, right? Like web two experience developers. And if there's one thing about, you know, blockchain, um, DAP, smart contracts, it's really the UI and the UX that's that we really need, uh, we really need to like, work on. And I feel like these experienced web two developers can really bring that into our ecosystem, not just our Algorand ecosystem, but more broadly, the blockchain ecosystem. So I think there's also just like this tapping into um, the experience of these Python developers that I think is pretty, that is pretty exciting too. Oh, can I like that comment about a thousand times? Like that's what I've been talking about this whole time. My, my, my suspicion is that crypto attracted a lot of engineers, a lot of coding engineers 
who got really excited about like, can we make this thing work? But I think they didn't tend to bring with them UX people who could say like, hey, cool, it works, but like the average user comes here and has no idea what you're talking about. Hey, by the way, you need some documentation to explain this to people or you need some kind of like little tutorial program or something. Like a lot of that stuff is just missing in crypto. Um, that's one of the reasons I like SWE so much, actually, because SWE tends to uh, SWE ten has tended to really focus on that UX portion. They've tried to make things think of like, how can we make this to be something that is usable by the average person? And I think what Min is saying here is really smart. I think it I think it makes a big difference if you can have if you can have your programs actually usable. Because I think eventually you want this stuff to get to the outside world. Like I think we talked about that stat when we did the when I did that reaction to the Meet Kevin video. One of the things that we saw Jerry Chu say, the CEO of Lofty, uh, is that there a lot of the people. I think he said most actually most of their users were were not Algorand native, which I thought that blew me away. It doesn't surprise me though, because when I've talked about Lofty, first off, it's the one. Um, it's the one crypto project where I'm like, oh, the average person could kind of relate to this. Like they know real estate, they know real estate investing. They, they know, you know, that's it. And also it is set up so you don't have to have an Algorand wallet. You can use your own Lofty wallet there. And actually there's some benefits to that. Um, right now, all the liquidity pools work if you have your token on the Lofty chain and not uh, somewhere else. So, but it's interesting. I, th I think it's one of the few chains that really work like that and still the ux definitely needs improvement there's a lot of stuff that's just really poorly explained and not self not self-evident when you use the platform so i think what min is talking about here 100 percent, thousand percent agree i hope what she says comes to fruition um yeah what do you guys think about that by the way i definitely recommend checking out her checking out the verifiably random uh show on algorand you can find it on it's on like Spotify and, you know, all the podcast platforms and you can watch it on YouTube as well. You know, the benefit there is like you can speed it up and, you know, you can uh, clip things or whatever. You can watch, you can actually see what they look like. I think that's fun sometimes.